And tonight we are beyond, beyond grateful to have the work of Samia Halabi in the space whose work has made such an impact, not only in the realm of culture, but within movements and the liberation of Palestine for years and years. So please give a, a warm welcome, a warm round of applause. Tonight's event was planned and organized by us at the People's Forum, Artists Against Apartheid, and the Palestinian Youth Movement. <laughs> Artists Against Apartheid is a network of almost 12,000 artists and cultural workers around the world who join hands with the people of the world and with the heroic people of Palestine to stop this genocidal war and put an end to the 75 years of occupation. We understand the great power our work has in shaping public opinion in our time, and we recognize that as artists, we have a unique responsibility to use our voices and our artistic practices uh, in, the, in the struggle for liberation. We are so proud to be coming together as organizations towards the liberation of Palestine to both celebrate Samia Halabi's work and to recognize the great power of art and culture in shaping our movements. Our organizations will always be home for artwork that is deemed too dangerous to be displayed in cultural institutions that serve only the elite. Because we know the incredible and transform transformative power of art and cultural work in our movements and beyond. This exhibition tonight brings out works by Samia Halabi that haven't been shown before on the walls of massive institutions, but are, that are, are themselves active parts of the movement for Palestine. You see banners, signs, posters, all of which have been used in the streets, in our movements. And they still bear evidence of their usage. Frayed, frayed edges, fingerprints, creases. Past iterations of the posters are sometimes visible underneath the paint and are relics of their, of their, of their use. This art that demands to be carried in the streets. In this urgent moment, it is imperative that artists and cultural workers follow Halabi's example and use their practices as tools, tools towards liberation. The power of art and culture is obvious, especially as Zionist and mainstream institutions continue to censor works and artists that recognize and uplift Palestinian liberation. So with that, I am more than honored to introduce my, my friend and my comrade, Lulu of the Palestinian Youth Movement, to introduce Samia Halabi and our continued program. Thank you all so much for being here. Thanks, Hannah. Hey, y'all. How's it going? I'm used to speaking at like rallies and stuff, so this is a different vibe. Um, as Hannah said, my name is Lulu, and I am with the Palestinian Youth Movement. For those of you that do not know us, we are a transnational grassroots organization of Palestinian and Arab youth who are organizing for the liberation of our homeland. Yeah, you can clap for that. So uh, to begin with, I'd like to kind of orient us to um, our fundraising efforts that are happening here tonight. The artwork uh, of posters and postcards for purchase today at the front of the room by the front doors have been generously made available by Samia. There is also an ongoing campaign on Everpress where you can purchase apparel with Halabi's 1971 poster design, Step by Step Until Total Liberation. This is an iconic work that has never been available, never been made available before in this format. Money from both of these initiatives are being collected for mutual aid work in Gaza, specifically for the Without Tears humanitarian camp in Rafah. The money but will be used for basic necessities and food. And we have determined that this is the most urgent and effective form of aid we can provide Gaza in this moment. So we really, really urge you to participate in this cause. Please take time at the end of the event to look at the, um, the postcards and the posters that we have available take time to also go online and order the t-shirt. It's a really unique opportunity to have uh, Samia's work in these forms, but it's 
even more unique and important to be supporting um, these fundraising efforts right now. Okay. Um, and now, <laughs> it's my honor to introduce our speakers for tonight. It goes without saying that Samia Halabi is one of our greatest living artists. Born in Jerusalem, Palestine in 1936, she immigrated to the U.S. with her parents at 14 years old. Since the 1970s, she has been rooted in New York City, where she paints from her Tribeca studio. As a young professor, Halaby received tenure at Indiana State University and was the first woman professor at Yale School of Art. Recently, she was slated to have a massive retrospective show at her alma mater, ISU, called Centers of Energy, and this was shamefully canceled by the administration due to Zionist pressure. This only called further attention to the principal stance that Halabi has always taken to never normalize Zionism or compromise her values. She has never shied away from the political. In fact, while many of us are familiar with Halabi's artistic career, her work as an organizer and activist is equally significant. So today we are honoring not just her ongoing artistic ex excellence, but also her decades of organizing. She has served various movements with arti artistic production that raises the bar for the visual communication of our demands. Always ahead of her time, Halabi's posters reveal consistent values over the decades. In the 1990s, she was a vocal critic of the Oslo Accords. Even as elites pushed acquiescence, Halabi showed massive clarity in criticizing them as the facade that they were. Even before the siege on Gaza, her posters acutely pinpointed the Zionist end goal of ethnic cleansing there and across Palestine. Her ability to see through these lines between struggles puts her at the cutting edge of cultural production as resistance and solidarity. One of her works displayed here reads, Disarm the Murderous Settlers. In other words, she has been steadily, she has been steadfastly pushing a line that many movements today have yet to catch up to. And you can see that work in the back over here. At 87, Halabi continues to work tireless, tirelessly constantly innovating, continuing to take a stand and refusing to settle for anything less than excellence in her craft. She has been out on the streets and creating as recently as this latest genocide. Samia, it is truly an honor to have you here tonight. Thank you. Samia will be joined in conversation by her longtime comrade with whom she has engaged in mutual struggle for many decades, Nellie Hester Bailey. Nellie is the co-founder of the Harlem Tenants Council founded in 1994 as a tenant-led grassroots organization. She is also the founder of the Harlem Anti-War Coalition and was a member of SNCC. A round of applause. And finally, we are joined by Munir Atallah, a member of the Palestinian Youth Movement and a filmmaker. Munir and Samia uh, collaborated on a short documentary, which we will screen here today after I finish speaking. And then we will um, have a moderated conversation with Nelly, Samia, and then followed by a Q&A. Let's get it started. Art is part of the society, it always reflects what happens around it. 
painting is a visual language that influences everything. I see abstraction as an imitation of reality. It might teach you how to look if you open your eyes and want to look some more. I was born in Jerusalem where all my parents and parents' parents were born. I used to like drawing. My margins of my school books had little sketches in them. My grandmother's garden in Jerusalem, that influenced me visually a great deal. There are places that impact you visually in that way. They enter your sensations. I can almost feel them in my hands right now. And so when I'm looking at the painting, often I want that sensation back. In 1951, my father and mother had come to the decision that it was safer to bring their family up in the U.S. I did not want to come. I was 14 and was to high school. I couldn't decide between the sciences. It was my mother who finally said, you always loved art, why don't you study art? I gained tenure at Indiana University and decided that really I wanted to be in New York, but it's hard to just pick up and have no money and come to New York, a city I don't know anybody or anything in. I moved in 76. I continued trying to get a gallery for years. It was total rejection. In this world, People don't see, if you're Palestinian, don't see what you make, they see you. And they don't like us Palestinians. <laughs> slowly, slowly, it just dawned on me that it was worthless to keep struggling because it became emotionally very difficult. I began to have an anxiety attack almost every time I entered the gallery. And they can be very, very rude and very cutting in New York. I became more an activist. We were fighting for the right to return to Palestine, to our homes, for equality, the whole new system. And that really liberated my artwork uh, and liberated me. I became very productive as a painter at the time, very explorative and experimental. I was able to see the beauty in the world and that was very energizing, empowering and created color and optimism in my work. Any time that there is a forward motion in art, it is using the technology of its time. I'd been interested in the com uh, computer for a while. I felt I should try it and find out if I'm really an artist of my time. So I uh, bought an Amiga. I fell in love with the results and was glued to the Amiga for at least two years, combining what we see in reality as we move with what we hear and putting them into abstraction and motion. Those artworks were, in my consideration, some of the most advanced thinking I've done in painting. My friends basically uh, thought it was great fun, so did I. I used to giggle every time I saw one of those Amiga pieces. They are very funny, but in a nice way. I work on two, three, sometimes four or five paintings at the same time. When I enter to get going, then the paintings begin to permeate my consciousness. The paintings do not arise out of feeling. They arise out of thinking. Uh, and, and I'm very scientific in the way I think and plan. But when I do them, it's in, I trust my intuitions. Fulfilling every whim that comes along. Balancing back and forth between what I intuit is right and what I want to do. And which one wins is hard to tell. When a thing, painting is going badly, I'm feeling badly. 
but not because my feeling is in the painting. I'm reacting to frustration. But when it's going well, I'm very happy because I've captured something I've wanted to capture. When you come to the painting, your brain is smarter than your consciousness of things is. So you've seen these things before. You've realized driving, living in the city, that there's a pattern to the way cars move in the city. You're only learning that what you have experienced can become language, can be visual language embodied in this painting. So you like the painting because you recognize in it what is already in you. <laughs> We're never asked to think about what remains in our memory after we walk a street five times, let's say. And so there's something remains in the memory. As I was saying about Palestine, something remains that I, I almost feel it with my hands. I can make it, I put it in a painting, uh, but it's not a photographic image. It's what remains visually in memory. It's something palpable and real. What your iPhone or cell phone is telling you when you take a picture is only a teeny slice of what is in front of it when you take the picture. It's an image of a fragment of time of reality. But a new abstraction can result from a new way of seeing. I'm 82, soon 83. <laughs> I think it's the best stuff I've done. Now people are buying my paintings, so I can afford to keep painting. It's nice that it happened at this stage because I'm less likely to be put off my path than I would have been maybe when I was younger. It was very strange. With all the trying and trying over a period of 30 years, I couldn't get any serious dealer to represent me in this atmosphere. And I think it's me they object to, not my work. My act of resistance against the propaganda and brainwashing of our time is I want it clear and obvious that I'm an Arab and a lover of the Arab world and a Palestinian born in Jerusalem and it's my city. I was thinking before I started selling with Ayam that all of my big paintings are one day going to be taken to the garbage by, you know, whoever cleans out my studio. But now I feel like they won't be. I'm very glad. Right, thank you everyone for being here. And another round of applause for Samia and Nelly. <laughs> it's a huge honor to be here with uh, two movement elders, uh, two friends and comrades in the struggle. And uh, uh, I wanted to start with a question uh, for you, Samia. Um, you know, you experienced Palestine both before and after the Nakbe. Um, and I think it's important to sort of ground us in that, in that history and in that experience. Can you share a little bit about, uh, you know, from your personal perspective, a reflection on, on that history? Um, I, I want to answer that, and then if I may, I have a few remarks to make in general. Um, uh, one of the things that is important about realizing about Palestine beforehand is that it was a, an Arab country uh, that was in the 
late 19th century beginning to turn from a feudalist socii society to what's making it sing? Okay, to a, a capitalist society, and the arts were changing accordingly. And accordingly, and also remember that nations were being formed in Europe at that time, and Germany had just been formed in 1860. Before that, there were, it was not an age of nations. But Palestine was late, and all the other nations already formed began uh, 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 coming to Palestine to colonize. So the British were in everything. Uh, they just interfered with everything, and as the uh, World War I came, there was a really serious famine in Palestine, created artificially by the American and the British. Uh, and after that, the British decided, well, came and they settled in and they decided that uh, uh, they would exploit the pain of the, uh, 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 they would exploit the, the pain of the Jews in Europe as persecuted people and use them to bring them in as, as uh, settlers for their plans. Um, so, but Palestine was developing. There was a, a, a serious development in the arts, and uh, there is misunderstanding about that development because people do not want to consider that feudalist arts were art. They want to consider them as, um, they generally, in propaganda, want to say, well, art, uh, Palestine learned painting from Europe. But Palestine may have learned uh, Palestine, uh, Arabs always put pigment on material on the ground, but there was more uh, 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 other materials than oil on canvas. So, yes, and there was journalism, and there was a lot of stuff, and there were big cities, and it was a going art, uh, world. Uh, right, uh, afterwards, you see us presented as villagers and peasants, but that's because it's easier for the West to consider destroying us. So, sorry I went too long on that answer, but... Um, I was going to say something about uh, what Gaza brings to me is it takes me back to 1948. Uh, what's singing? Uh, Gaza takes me back to 1948 and my experiences. Um, and uh, basically, uh, in a very small way, Basically, I remember my house is still there. It is still occupied. Others are living in it. And uh, all my possessions as a child, my clothes, my, uh, my family's possessions, everything was looted and probably sold in flea markets in Tel Aviv. Uh, so th the pain of that experience comes back to me. Uh, and now to being an artist. I'm Palestinian and I'm a painter. Uh, and when I say I'm a painter, I want to take out, and they, they, so basically I'm asked, where is Palestine in your work? And where Palestine is in my work is, uh, uh, Palestine is in me, but I'm a thinker. And uh, I ask back, if you need a doctor, do you want them only to specialize in Palestinian art, and uh, Palestinian medicine? So one of the things I, I decided was, well, who's asking the question? Who wants to put me to put Palestine in my work and why? And then uh, Western art history uh, misrepresents everything. So you have to think, I began a whole theory of art from zero to the present time in order to know where I was wanted to go. And basically I removed the idea of fine art throw it out and say art. Art is a craft. Uh, I make a craft, uh, and my craft can make a painting or a poster or a banner. Uh, and the poster and banners can be used as weapons in, 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 in a movement. But pictures are a human language that's ancient and very important and primary. And that language is what I wanted to explore. I wanted to place myself at the leading edge of exploration of language, and that's where my painting lives. So my painting can't be political, except that it is political when you analyze the movement of art history and you realize that abstraction is the art of the working class. So from that point, all I do is political. But uh, that's a whole 
huge discussion. We had it upstairs. The fact is that abstraction was born uh, the idea of the general. First of all, what in abstraction does the working class say? It says we don't care about praising the rich. We don't care about their games and their rich homes and their accoutrements. And we don't care what they, what they, what they look like. We don't want to hang them on their, our walls. Forget it. <laughs> we are exploring ideas and ideas that have to do with general principles. And general principles uh, are the nature of the working class. We're not interested in particular little cubby holes. We know that me here and, and, and my friend Nelly have the same experiences, and we know we, are, we can solidify with each other. We don't need to put a national border between us. So we build solidarity. We understand solidarity. We understand general principles. And, I, and, and general principles are important. You know, you all learn addition, subtraction, and division when you're kids, right? What would you do without them? General principles are an abstract painting, and that's why it's very, very political, and that's why it's the art of, besides which most of it was developed at times of revolution. Of course, the, the bureaucracy, the Soviet bureaucracy, did not have the smarts to realize that, so come in the American bourgeoisie and claims it as New York abstraction, and here we go. And then they get tired of it. We're not going to praise this art. We're going to create postmodernism. Instead of constructivism, we're going to do de deconstructivism. So it all makes sense. So it is very political, but it doesn't serve direct political content. Uh, yeah. So uh, my red line as an activist was um, we have the right to return. We have the right to defend ourselves, the right to self-determination. And I want Palestine to be an Arab state when we put it all back together, uh, one way or the other after a revolution. Um, so we see horrors taking place. I can't believe some of the things I had to stay quiet about because nobody wanted to listen or believe. But uh, here we are now at a period when People are looking at Palestine and, and, and considering and seeing what's going on. Um, we've built solidarity, and it is very important, the solidarity with the black liberation movement, with black liberation in the US, Chicano, Hawaiian, uh, Puerto Rican, and very important, uh, respect for uh, indigenous Turtle Islanders, and you know, you all know, I hope, what Turtle Island is. So we don't, we're not calling for a national autonomy, uh, national liberation for them. I would say we believe in autonomy for them. They have a right to have autonomous areas. Um, so we also, in our days, tried our best to build solidarity with the Jews, uh, with Jewish activists, and I think we're beginning to realize that. And from that point of view, I have admiration for uh, the Jewish Voices for Peace. And I want to thank the Neto Ricarta for their always being around and supporting us. Um, and um, Gaza, I, I think uh, there can be a description of Gaza. Gaza did not happen. Uh, 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 in a few months. Gaza has been going on as a, as a camp, as a prison camp for decades. Uh, the genocide is not just Gaza. It's been, frankly, what I have learned this period of time is I define Israel as a slow-release genocide planned by the U.S. Uh, establishment. When you think of anyone saying this is a land without a people for a people without a land, you're saying we're going to get rid of them. So isn't that a plan for genocide? And it has been ongoing. Some of the things I found out when I interviewed people for the Kafar Qasem massacre were no different than all the things we're seeing now. And thank, and thank you to the beautiful people of Gaza. What they have done is amazing. Uh, the, how much they have paid in life for us to see what's going on. Uh, I could go on about the heroism. But most of all, I want to present a quick idea that is very important. And uh, that is one of the things I've learned 
in these recent months is that we can keep asking ceasefire, ceasefire, ceasefire now, etc. We can go on asking free Palestine, but who are we asking? Uh, are we asking those who have oppressed us to, to allow us this? And I think I've seen in the past enough times where you keep asking, they get upset with us, they just turn the guns on us, right? So uh, we have seen that there is really some progress that is taking place. That if we say cease fire through working class means, we can then proceed to consider how useful there has been unions all throughout the world, in India very much, the, all the port workers uh, declared they will not handle Israeli arms or any shipment of arms or material to Israel. There have been Italian unions who have been very, uh, very active. There has also been in the uh, west coast of the USA very successful uh, efforts. So I think we should be saying ceasefire by working class means. We should work. And anyone who is interested in working on that, I, uh, I know that there's a committee in PYM uh, devoted to working with unions. I think we should be uh, organizing with unions, uh, mass movements, uh, and supporting them and uh, asking for their support with humility because we have a lot to learn from them. And so if members of that committee would like to leave their names, anyone else who wants to leave their address, with, with a member of that committee that Munir might choose. I'll be glad to share links of information. Uh, and thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, Nelly, I wanted to ask you, you know, having decades of uh, history in, in the struggle, uh, what is your sort of assessment of this unique moment that we're in? Well, first, uh, let me give some uh, context uh, to uh, my answer, um, I was a, many, I was one of hundreds of black students throughout the South organized by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, one of the earliest and at the time the only supporter of Palestine. Free, free Palestine from the river to the sea. That was the Student Nonviolent Co Coordinating Committee. And that political stance created a division within the organization because you can imagine who our financial supporters were. They were from New York. They were not black people. And so it caused an un irreparable rift. And which led to the breakup of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that made it very clear that there would be no wavering whatsoever for its support of Palestine. At the time, at the time there was a newspaper published, I wish I had a copy of it. Everyone who was part of the organization keeps searching around for it. Uh, for that particular edition of the paper, but it caused quite a stir because it was, uh, it talked about Zionism. And remember, we are not talking about today, we're talking about the early and mid 60s. Think, think the mid 60s at a time and a period that is older than most of you in this room. And you can imagine, you can imagine the blowback at the time. As a matter of fact, uh, two of the um, uh, authors of that newspaper uh, were later uh, uh, killed in a, in a bomb that exploded uh, in uh, Che and uh, I can't think of the other person's name. Uh, which is a history that, uh, that we have yet to resolve, even though some of the former SNCC members invited uh, 
the attorney general for uh, Obama to their conference and did not ask him, Eric Holder, did not ask him not once to investigate that close case and unsolved case. Now, secondly, I just want to, to additionally give context to how I met uh, Samia is uh, uh, I was a uh, one of I organized uh, a delegation to the first uh, South uh, free elections in South Africa that was under Dr. Wyatt Walker and I met um, uh, Mandela and the rest of them and of course Elambe Breath that um, that uh, uh, Samia has uh, has done a picture of the Black Cross. Uh, was a fact a supporter of the PAC and you can imagine that that didn't go down very well but later on when uh, uh, it was uh, Nelson Mandela opted for the Western model of capitalism uh, for South Africa's uh, revival for South Africa coming out of this apartheid system that clearly clearly has not worked and has not and continues to be a problem, even though it was the South African government that brought the charges of genocide against uh, the uh, against Israel. But it is important that we do have historical content uh, for this. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about how I met my good friend here of uh, some 25 years or more. We were at a demonstration, and I think among you young people, you know when you are drawn quite naturally to another person, another cause, because it's there. It was you. It was part of you. Uh, for some of you who don't remember Rosewood, a black community that was bummed out, and so many others, Black Wall Street, there is a natural affinity, there is a natural link to the struggle of Palestine for black Americans. And we will never forget that. It will always be a part of our consciousness. It will always be a part of the working class resistance worldwide that we have with Palestine and all of the others who resist against the genocidal uh, uh, impact of US imperialism. But I ask you to remember that these are the best of times as they are the worst of times. Because for the first time, we can say, look at the conversation that Israel has opened up. We can talk about the Zionist control of the US Congress. Could we have said that five years ago? Could we have said that 10 years ago? No, we couldn't have. And we have voices for peace, Jewish voices for peace. We have the gray zone with the incredible Aaron Mate and Max Blumenthal and his wife. And we have uh, Judge in Freedom uh, with uh, so many ex-CIA analysts who are calling it. Now, Joe- So much for that. Um, Samia, you, we, we heard in the film a little bit about how, you know, you spoke about how your moral fearlessness and your activism kind of unlocked this uh, artistic fearlessness in your work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, I, uh, I did say that, and I did experience it. When I was very busy as an activist, all day long I would be running around meetings, uh, demonstrations, this, that, and the other arranging. And then I'd come home, but instead of being tired, somehow I did the best work I've ever done at that, because I felt very free and very relaxed, and uh, I experimented a great deal. It was, a, a, it was special. There is something that takes place uh, in the mind when we uh, free ourselves from the habits of propaganda. We still, you know, I still feel I'm loaded with bad habits, but, you know, you, you overcome them step by step. 
Absolutely, yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't know about the time you spent in Hawaii and uh, some of the connections you made between the indigenous struggle there and the struggle in Palestine. I think you were one of the first people to sort of not just make that connection conceptually, but also act on it in your artwork and in your practice. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I, I, I discussed things with a couple of members who were very activist, um, and, uh, but I didn't go into joining them in their activity. Um, but I did experience uh, something unusual in that I looked around and I would be driving about and I would su suddenly see a, a, a road sign uh, and it would be King Kamehameha Highway such and such and I would say, okay, I'm seeing King Hameha, Kamehameha, this is imperialism, looks like stuff I've seen in Jordan. Instead of King Kamehameha, I'm, I'm in Jordan, I'm seeing the King of Jordan and his son. Or in Palestine, I'm soon seeing Abu Ammar, picture, picture, picture. I mean, enough. Uh, but the thing I did was an, a piece of artwork that was uh, uh, dedicated, I de decided to dedicate the piece uh, to the Hawaiian people and to the and to the Hawaiian working class, and we when we talk about uh, it, just a little tangent here. I said the right to autonomy. I did ra talk to Hawaiians who were still living on their own land, hadn't left it, but Hilton went up here and Hilton number two over there, and their taxes skyrocketed. They couldn't afford the taxes that were suddenly came down, and it is an occupation that takes them off the land. So when we say the right to autonomy, it means a great deal. For, I see the, I've seen it from experience, what it does. But I made this artwork, and I dedicated it to the Hawaiians because I heard, uh, and I called it Ni'ihau. Uh, and Ni'ihau is an island which is owned by one uh, family, one man, and this man uh, 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 has been given the right to control it and control the lives of the people in it. U.S. government does not interfere and say the people who live here are allowed to vote, are allowed to have uh, money, are allowed transportation or medical care. He is, he is the total emperor here, and they work for him. They pay them in script, not in money, and their children go to a, a prison school off-island Etc. So they and they and then in Waikiki you're supposed to buy these sh seashell necklaces and be proud you're helping the natural Hawaiians living the way they are and, uh, and and meanwhile they're living as slaves in their own land if they leave they can't come back if they marry they can't bring their spouse so they got very upset that I dedicated this piece to the Hawaiian people and to the working class in Hawaii. And uh, they called a conference of teachers, and uh, they were going to discuss the faculty show in which I had this big piece. And uh, they tried to fry me. <laughs> and someone took me out to dinner. Sorry, I'm telling a fun story. And, and, the, and I'm saying, we're supposed to be at this faculty discussion. You know, let's go back. They kept delaying, delaying. And finally got me there. And what did I find standing behind my chair? It was delightful. You're going to be, it, 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 my description would make you think it was negative. But actually, the university had a, a, a program where senior citizens could, could take the courses free. And there was this huge worker. He's standing behind my chair. <laughs> and he's saying, you dare trouble with this woman. I'm, I'm here to protect her. So. It, it was a, a delightful event all the way around. So that was my connection to Hawaii. <laughs> and Thank you for sharing. Hawaii. Thank you so much. Um, oh, and let me con comment. Nelly, we'll talk about culture. Um, Elombe Brat is a, 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 a black people, African American a scholar whom I met, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't get to know him more. And uh, he was behind the Black is Beautiful movement, which took place and, uh, uh, when I was still a young professor in the Midwest. And uh, I came here and met him, and one night he was talking about it and joking about uh, the situation. 
uh, and uh, just remembering. And so I did a painting which was, a, 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 I was doing geometric art and I was doing a, a, a cross, but it wasn't a crucifix. So I lifted the horizontal up and decided it would be a crucifix and uh, I made the dedication to black. I called it Black is Beautiful and then dedicated it to Elombe Breath. And uh, recently, uh, a very fun thing happened. Uh, the uh, sh show of shows, a bourgeois show of shows in the world is the Venice Biennial. And I never thought I'd be in the Venice Biennial. Forget it, you have to be, you have to be a member of an accepted state and I have no country. So, and America definitely wasn't putting me in their, pav <laughs> in their pavilion. So, here I am, and then come this, the, 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 they decided to choose a Brazilian curator for a change. Curators had been from Europe all the time, maybe America. And comes this Brazilian curator, and he decides he was going to represent the global south. Mm -hmm. And he comes and I'm in the central heart show of the Venice Biennial, and there are four Palestinians in it. <laughs> yeah! Woo! So, but we're trying to close down the Israeli pavilion, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to talk about some of the pieces at this show that, that we see here, um, you know, one of them is this incredible banner um, that you hand drew and that was, you can tell, taken out into the streets with pride. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how each individual in it is uh, really, you know, distinct? It's not just a sea of, uh, you know, soulless faces, but there's children uh, carrying mm -hmm. rocks. There's young men uh, wrapped in the kofiya. There's women wearing the thobe. Uh, it really looks like a community and like there's, there's such a vibrance to each character in that, in that painting. Can you touch a little bit on it and about that theme in your work? We also see it in the in the paintings of the two Kanafanis, mm. uh, the which we'll talk about in a second. But yeah, the 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 Palestine Aid Society was a committee that worked in the U.S. and we there were chapters all over. I believe it was in the 70s and uh, 80s, and we tried to do a lot of things. And uh, this banner was for that group. It was a grassroots organization which had a, 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 an equal uh, partner in Beirut. And uh, what, the reason that they're so individual is that I collected from, and I wish I had kept the original, We every group was publishing a newsletter and there would be pictures and I needed pictures. So I was collecting pictures from all the newsletters I could get, and uh, so I had, uh, so each one was a person that I took out of a photograph. That's mm. why they're individuals. Mm. And if we could touch on these two, the paintings of the two Kanafanis, um, there's two, two uh, you know, paintings here highlighted that uh, were painted decades apart, but of, you know, the same subject. Uh, can you talk about the significance of returning to the subject later on. I think one was painted in the 70s and one was painted in 2017. Um, the yeah. first one was a drawing, a pastel on paper. I'm looking at it over there. And um, it was uh, sent to the uh, uh, plastic arts section of the PLO in Beirut with a few mm -hmm. other drawings. And um, uh, there was a bombing of the Museum of Solidarity with Palestine where these drawings were. But this one survived, others were bombed out. And it is now with his wife, he is passed away, of course. He was assassinated, of course. And uh, it is with his wife, Annie Canafani. And the other one, uh, and so this was, it was in the 70s, I believe, the date of that one, I'm not sure. But the second one was done recently, probably 18 or 19 recently. And it was done because uh, a collector uh, felt he was a supporter of uh, Hassan Kanafani and wanted and went to Annie and tried to buy it from her. And he felt he could win, but she wouldn't. She was stubborn. <laughs> so she kept it. And, and so he commissioned me to do the other one. In the end, I gave it to him as a gift. So. Mm. 
But one of those, those are different people in there, yes. Uh, the one that I drew from memory that is very important, if you remember there was a film made called Janine Janine, I don't know if you remember. Uh, Janine Janine, there was a young, very dynamic 12-year-old child who was talking so enthusiastically, so powerfully, if you remember, so I painted her in from memory. You see, uh, you see the old woman in the lower corner, mm -hmm. and ne next to her is the child, my memory of the child from that film. And the rest of them were from, uh, from uh, pictures. And, and uh, once uh, someone came, the collector, someone came and I gave them a kofiya. You know the kofiya, by the way. Uh, we wore it, why? We wore it, I didn't, wasn't there then, but it was worn in the 30s when the British were killing the villagers because the villagers were very, uh, 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 very um, uh, determined. They were the fighters. And uh, they were very, uh, and so the the city people started wearing this, so the the British wouldn't know who's a villager and who isn't. So we wore it to camouflage and protect the villagers. As time went by, the red one, by the way, is was Saudi by tradition, but the the uh, uh, leftists and the communists decided they were going to wear the red one. So. Uh, that became a new tradition. We took it from Saudi Arabia and made it uh, more a leftist uh, one. <laughs> so, yes. Wonderful, thank you. Um, you know, uh, on, on March 30th, uh, it's the Palestinian Day of, of the Land. And uh, a question for both of you is to, to touch on the significance of, of land uh, throughout your struggles and, um, yeah, sort of the, the links between them. Well, of course, land defines a people that is part of who they are, who their children, generations. It speaks of that here, uh, and I think it started with um, I think it started with the Communist Party, the Black Belt South. I, some of you may be familiar uh, with that, and uh, this was land that was cultivated by slaves. Uh, uh, during, uh, by black people during the period of slavery. And so uh, one hears the expression quite often if you are at um, black events, free the land, free the land. And that's what we're talking about. And it is the same with Palestine, free the land, in this case from the river to the sea. And land is crucial because with land, with your, um, with your, uh, uh, your being tied to the land, uh, being identified with the land, being uh, uh, it, it, for it to be generational, the generational ties is very important because it defines who we are, doesn't it? It defines who we are and where we're going. And when Samia talks about her home, someone else has it, but she has memories of that. And that becomes important in the right of return for Palestinians. And it is the right of blacks and Native Americans uh, to hold on to their land, the first indigenous people here in this country. And that land is important in how even to this day, Native Americans are fighting the U.S. government for the right of their, the ownership of their land. And we know because the right of return has been, can be, has been and is used by many groups, if not directly the right uh, of return, but it is self-determination and our right, our rights to hold our land, to keep our land, that it is ours and it is not to be confiscated by the government 
for the bourgeois, for the oligarchs, as we see all over the country. That's what the Global South is fighting about, the uh, peasants in Brazil, and it's about land, and because land gives one life. It gives you life. Anyway, that's, um, that's it. <laughs> Go for another one. Yeah, let's go. Um, Samia, I wanted to ask you about this uh, painting that we saw in the film um, of the Dome of the Rock. Uh, it's, a, it's a more abstract take on it. It's your individual take on it. Can you talk about uh, the impact of Jerusalem uh, on your work uh, and also the, the art of Masjid al-Aqsa in this holy month? Uh, tell us a little bit about its impact on your work as well. Um, Arabic art... And I use the term Arabic. I know we're supposed, in, in most texts they use Arab, but I don't like because it, it, the connotations are not exactly correct. Arabian? But no, I don't like. I like Arabic. So <laughs> Arabic art, uh, like uh, the Arabic language, tends to be very rhythmic and geometric, as though there is something in us that loves... Uh, mathematics, algebra, geometry, uh, they started in areas, uh, the Arabs contributed substantially there. And so you, we look at our grammar, and here we conjugate. We conjugate ad infinitum as though it is a <laughs> pleasure. Uh, we <laughs> conjugate nouns, we conjugate adjectives. <laughs> and if you really wanna know how many infinitives there are to each basic verb, 11 is what I studied, but in the original languages, probably much more. Mm -hmm. So you add them all up and you're in trouble. So, <laughs> so we, we have a certain love of abstraction. That's why the art is so based on geometry. Mm. And the geometry in this architectural monument is amazing. And it deeply influenced the, the baptistery in Florence, but no one's going to admit any influences from the Arabs, <laughs> but uh, never mind that. So uh, I, and the other thing I notice is that uh, those who collect art now and those who run museums, you know, they collect African art but they don't care about Africans. They collect sometimes what they don't understand, but they know enough that they know enough to know that it's valuable, so they take care of it and collect it. I go to the Metropolitan, I look at Arabic art there, and I swear they don't understand what they have, but that's okay. <laughs> it's preserved. So uh, there is, it is images, they are pictures, and they're realistic. Uh, but they call them repeat patterns and cutting, you know, and wallpaper and decorations. They, they cannot get over the fact that there is something else there. So that is an influence in my work, but it doesn't appear that way. This one, strangely enough, is, uh, is under Arabic influence by the geometry. I, was, I wanted to present, it's not the, the dome of the rock, does not, it's not a semicircle. But I wanted to paint it as a sphere, and so I lied a little bit. But I wanted the geometry to be two, two squares next to each other, and how I fit the arc of the sphere. And I painted the sphere illusionistically. Hmm. Um, and I did it because I wanted to celebrate Jerusalem. Because you see the Dome of the Rock everywhere as a golden, even it used to be even when the Israelis gave their news, they'd show the Dome of the Rock. Uh, they'd show the Golden Dome. The Golden Dome stands for Israel, for uh, Jerusalem, excuse me. You know, about that we should talk. They steal our culture. <laughs> and they rob us of our culture, and they want us to be cultureless because that renders us weak, weak, you know? So what are falafel after all? Where did they learn to make them? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, really? Uh, and don't they do that to African-American? African Absolutely. So, and it continues. 
Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, touching on, on uh, you know, th your struggle against uh, museums, these institutions of curation, galleries, can you tell us a little bit about what you spoke about in the film, uh, your struggle to gain representation here, uh, the success that came late in your career, and sort of the struggles against that, but seeing that repression and censorship continue even until this year uh, with, the, with your retrospective being canceled? For my first, my first advice to everybody, including especially young artists, is to uh, respect yourself. Self-respect is so important. Uh, so we, you know, I go to school, I study. I'm very open-minded. I want to learn everything they have to teach me. Uh, and I'm not objecting. You know, teach and talk, it's okay. I will decide what is going to be important to me, not you. I'll listen to you, but I'll decide. I'll absorb what I want, and I'll question it as I want. So uh, you can't help but question, because when you are oppressed and you're an object of racism, you see the lies so much more clearly. Uh, I used to joke about it, and I'm, I'm looking at them from the bottom up, so... It's not a very respectable view that I see. <laughs> it just isn't. And so I looked at art history and rewrote it for myself, basically. Mm -hmm. I wrote it according to uh, Marxist uh, understanding. You remember uh, Engels, uh, a history of the, I'm sorry, the family. Someone help me. Origin of the family. Origins of the family, the state, and private some property. and private property. Okay, you read that and you understand that we're not going to have uh, the the divisions of ancient uh, peoples are all artificial. So I changed that division and I went by Mark by Engels and Marxist division. We can talk about tribal, about slaveholding about, uh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm giving you art history here, but I'll be brief. And, we, and, and, and uh, feudalist art and capitalist art. And then you remember the principle of simultaneous un, uh, uneven uh, development. Okay, we have slaveholding art in Egypt 2,000 years ago. We have slaveholding art in the Maya 700 years ago, or, or a bit more. And we have slaveholding art in the Shang in China, uh, even older than Egyptian art. And they all have the same principles. Did the Shang come and meet Egypt and Egypt move 12 centuries forward and come and meet the Maya? No, it is human development that's behind the art. And this is why I am glad to declare that abstraction is the art of the working class because we are in a new age. New Age, uh, where revolution, the, the uh, first principles of the general were understood by the Impressionists when the Paris Commune was taking place. And we move forward with revolution in the Soviet Union, Mexican Muro movement, American abstract expressionism, and the, trade, uh, the industrial union movement, and so on. So I would say rely on yourself, look at art history, and move forward in learning and thinking for yourself. There's a huge difference between the arts and those who run museums. And frankly, they don't know what they're looking at. It is us who make the art, but they keep us at the bottom of the chain. Someone says a long time ago, where do you show? Where do I show? I don't have a, a, a control over where I show. They're, if the gallery chooses me, they choose me. If they don't, I can beg them and beg them. It's like saying ceasefire, ceasefire. They're not <laughs> going to do it. They're going to do what's profitable for them. So that's a long answer. Sorry. <laughs> well, there's so much to talk about, but I'd love to open it up to our yes. audience yes. and uh, hear some, give the people some chance to ask questions. So. Um, whoever's got a question, please, uh, we've got mics, and you can just raise your hand, and we'll, we'll call on some people. Um, so we've got a, a question over here, behind you, Hannah.
thank you for such an incredible talk, uh, Samia. Uh, my name's Ahmad. Um, since last October, I've been working on uh, finding and compiling um, early Palestinian websites from the late 90s and early 2000s and turning them into a browsable archive. And one of these websites uh, I found and include in the project very prominently is your own website uh, created on art.net uh, around 1998. Uh, specifically one section of this website uh, called Pictures and Words About Our Home in Palestine, uh, which includes short essays and stories you've written uh, interwoven with digital paintings by you uh, illustrating them. Uh, stories on Jerusalem, on Kafir Qasim, on your grandmother, um, on your student's art, um, and I want to thank you for creating such a beautiful uh, early online journal uh, during these uh, early days of the internet. Um, and when I've, I want to share with you, when I've shown this project to other people, uh, they've especially been enamored by your website. And today it feels uh, very visionary as the internet has become, um, especially in recent years and especially since October 7th, uh, primary commons uh, for Palestinians to express themselves and share their experiences on a universal, uh, universally accessible platform uh, as they're continuously neglected uh, and betrayed by mainstream media institutions. Uh, so I wanted to ask you as like an early pioneer uh, of digital art and of using the internet, um, did you always see it as a platform um, that had this disrupting potential even uh, when its usage, uh, when you made this website was way less than it is now? And did you imagine that networks um, on the internet would be such a crucial part of uh, Palestinian resistance, uh, self-advocacy, self-advocacy, and knowledge and culture sharing today? Well, uh, the first thought that strikes my, uh, the first thought that comes to me, is it, uh, something funny actually, since we're joking and laughing at them. It's the military who created the internet. <laughs> so here we are, we're using it, and, and eventually we'll be using it against them more effectively. But when the internet first came, um, uh, I had the good fortune of meeting someone who was a disenchanted uh, uh, management at a big computer company, and she had established a website. Um, and. Uh, she, this was the second uh, website for art on the internet. The first one was a collaborative one uh, where people worked on the same artwork together. Whereas uh, uh, Lily had created this uh, form, uh, this uh, as, as, as studios. And she invited me, we were at a computer conference together and she invited me. And, you know, it just happens. You don't foresee what is going to come. And uh, I, I actually wrote that website myself <coughs> using HTML. And uh, I was drawing with the mouse, and I put the stories up there. I almost forgot about it. And uh, <laughs> it's there. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Let's get a few more questions going, and we can maybe have three or three questions asked at a time, and then you all can respond to them uh, in sequence. So there's a question up here. Um, do we have a mic? Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Dania, and I'm wondering, as a young Palestinian theater artist, um, I think it's a really critical time to create disruptive art and for people to consume Palestinian art but I'm wondering what your advice is to someone like myself who sometimes has a hard time discerning between what may feel self-serving and what may feel um, like beneficial to like pushing forward the cause of liberation and disruption and just overall awareness. That's a good question. Um, I wanna make sure I understood. You're asking me, uh, you're asking about the two poles. When is it self-serving art and when it is socially useful and helpful? Okay. Um, uh, I don't know about the self-serving part. I think there is always something in us that's self-serving. 
we have to defend ourselves against uh, everything. Uh, we have to walk so that the truck doesn't run us over uh, coming down the street. Um, in a way, when you are doing something that you want to show to people, uh, you're self-serving, but at the same time, you're sharing. So whether when you sit, what's the difference between me showing a painting and us sitting in, a, in the park, you know, just gossiping or talking to each other? Um, I don't think, I think the idea that art is our self-expression is totally propaganda. I refuse it. Um, when people come to my studio and they like a painting, they don't like it because I, I express myself in it. They like it because there's something in them they recognize. If they didn't recognize it, why would they even like it, you know? And this is because we're human beings who make language. And if I have succeeded in making a piece of language which you understood because by just telling me you liked it or saying something about it that showed me you saw something, then I feel good because then I've communicated. And, and you've communicated by telling me, yes, this is correct. Because otherwise, maybe I made a mistake. And sometimes I put things in it that I don't know that others recognize. And they come and they show me and I recognize it. So it's a hard question to answer. So, so we do things that are self-serving. We do things that are self-controlling also. We don't say things that are impolite. Um, but we, we basically we're part of society and we have to act as, as, as individuals in that society. So one of the things I was joking about when people ask about self-expression, I tell them to imagine the Pope sitting with Michelangelo saying, dear boy, I have a commission for you. This Sistine ceiling, would you express your feelings all over it, please? <laughs> Thank so, you. Yeah. Uh, a few more questions. <laughs> Some questions for Samia or for Nelly. Mm. I see one over there, yeah. Oh, uh, hello. Um, you've been wonderf wonderful listening to you all evening. Um, difficult question to articulate, but I really appreciated you commenting on how institutions can so often really you know, fail the artists that they purport to, you know, represent. And I think, you know, as a young artist myself and maybe for others, how do you, if you have any ideas or advice as to navigating these institutions that so often fail, you know, Palestinians, you know, marginalized communities who are artists, even though we want to find reach and, you know, be able to make broad impact and develop ourselves. Could so advice navigating these institutions, uh, especially as young Palestinian artists, uh, when we're trying to establish ourselves and gain reach in our work while also having to deal with sort of the gatekeepers of the industry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you see, once you're talking about establishing yourself within capitalist, the capitalist world, you're trying to persuade someone to sell your work or to write about it. Th there are, I think, different ways. I think we like as artists... So I, I'm, you know, for years nobody cared about my work. I would go bring Palestinian art here so I could help and sell it for them. They would be paying for it, but look at my art never. So, you know, you, you do things. My first shows were in collaboration with other artists. So it's not that I'm, uh, I'm going, I kept going to the galleries, they kept saying forget it, and they can be very rude. Uh, so. You know, there are there used to be artist-run galleries. I would say the important thing is to, if you want activity and you want to be bring it out of the studio, which is important, is you colla collaborate with with others, and unify and make committees and 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 find places. I was a, a lot with people who uh, would find locations where you can show your art. They'd get a group of artists show it, have their own opening, and proceed that way. Um, it's, it's not easy, because we are not in control. 
I'm still not in control. Now I have a really good gallery, and sh you know, I have to, I'm so used to running my own life, and now she runs, wants to run it, so <laughs> new problems come up. So I, I don't have a really good answer, so, but uh, my answer is self-reliance and collaborate with your, e with your, with your uh, friends and other artists you know. What do you think, Nelly? <laughs> well, I can't possibly add anything else to what you have said. Uh, I think it's the soundest advice you will receive from a master. Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can get one, one or two more questions in before we... Yeah, one over there. Hi, um, how are you doing? I just wanted to ask, uh, I know you went over like the uh, student uh, nonviolent committee uh, with like Agent Rap Brown, um, who's currently incarcerated. Can you go over some of the ways that we could avoid some of the uh, shortcomings or some of the mistakes that were made that caused the divisions and actually deterred the movement? Yeah, I, I think the question was about how to avoid the uh, sort of internal schisms or disagreements that arise in. Uh, that, that arose in the disintegration of an organization uh, such as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Exactly. Yes. Um, well, uh, the biggest problem that faced uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and uh, you know, later on, this was a post period of uh, H. Rap Brown. Uh, Kwame Toure, who moved to Guinea-Bissau, uh, Willie Ricks, but the, um, the, the person who really gets into this, and it was a lesson for me, is Ifeo Wangaza, who was uh, in SNCC, uh, because the demystification of the black civil rights movement has not been historically accurate. Um, and uh, that history is, in fact, uh, quite shocking. One would find it hard to believe that it was Stokely Carmichael, a.k.a. Kwame Toure, who was initially against the Black Power slogan that was not invented by Willie Ricks, but in fact had been used by Reverend Adam Clayton Powell years and years before. And of course, Charles V. Hamilton had written a book on black power way before it became a legendary slogan of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, of the Black Panther Party, so forth and so on. And so, we, when we look at the demystification of that movement, it can be uncomfortable, particularly for those survivors. How many of us, all of us know about Dr. Martin Luther King, but how many of us know that it was Ella Baker who led to the, who created the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It was not King. It was Ella Baker, and so uh, and also it um, it uh, it it is about how the movement deals with the issue of patriarchy uh, that continues to dominate uh, that movement. And of course, we've all heard the argument. Uh, you know, the brothers have to stand on the shoulders of the sisters because they've been kept down. I mean, it's all bullshit, and we know that. But, uh, but the point is, how do we work through those, um, how do we work through those uh, uh, ideological conflicts, the, uh, the uh, all kinds of, um, and the number of other conflicts uh, that emerge out of this uh, schism uh, that emerge uh, out of this, uh, again, this schism that nevertheless created this synergy for this movement to continue and for others to join and expand and redefine that movement, if that answers 
your question somewhat. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, it's been a huge honor to be here today among two living legends. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for being here. Uh, I want to hand it off to my, my comrade, Lulu, to just wrap it up for us. Uh, but one more huge round of applause. Unless, uh, a final word for, for Sam. Yes, uh, please uh, remember the importance of uh, ceasefire, liberate Palestine through working class means. And please, uh, if you're interested in receiving the information, uh, bring, I have cards, you can give me your email and I will uh, pass them on to the committee at PYM. Thank you so uh, much. May, yes. may I just add to that? <clears throat> Not only a ceasefire, but no more funds for Israel. No more money for Israel. No more weapons for Israel. It is against the U.S. law to fund those countries with nukes. And we know from Van Nunu that in fact, the Israelis have nukes. No, not, no ceasefire, no funding to Israel, no money to Israel, no money whatsoever. We need free education here. We need free medical care here. And just let me say finally, on these college campuses, there are some, and thank God for Jewish for Peace, and let me say uh, Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal, and Aaron Mate. Oh, we love you, we love you. And I listen, this old lady listens to you every day. But let us remember, the Palestinian students were assailed and criticized and driven out of classrooms and colleges uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the false accusation that when they uttered uh, Palestine will be free from the rivers to the sea, but nevertheless, when Benjamin Netanyahu and his right-wing extremist government say, we want, Palest we want Israel from the river to the sea, how are Palestinian students supposed to feel? If that, is that a threat to them? If we reverse the argument, reverse the logic, then what does that mean for Palestinian students? But every single day, every single day across every ethnic uh, background, there emerges support for Palestine and it will last and it will be here and we will see a Palestine that is not a Bantu stand, but in fact, a country, a democratic, secular country. Thank you. Any final thoughts on that? Uh, for the liberation of the working class. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Okay, I'm not really sure how to follow this incredible conversation, but I've been given the task, so I'm going to do it. Um, and orient us back to where we are, which is New York City in this room at the People's Forum. And I'm wondering how many artists and cultural workers there are in the room. You can go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, wow. so this is for you, but it's really also for everybody in the room, regardless of what field you are in. Um, what I think we can, one thing that we can take from this conversation is the importance of the intersection between culture and politics. And so what this evening is about is not only recognizing the incredible work of Samia Halabi, but it is also a call to action. Y'all thought you were just coming in to hear a conversation, but there's no way that we would let you leave here without trying to organize you. Yeah, I mean, you are at the People's Forum, you are uh, at an event with the Palestinian Youth Movement. Um, so particularly in this moment of the current genocide unfolding in Gaza, cultural workers in the belly of the beast must take up their responsibility to end Western complicity in, Zion uh, in Zionism. 
New York City is one of the cultural capitals of the US empire. And many of the cultural in this institutions in the city have explicit and implicit ties to the Zionist entity, be it through funding or art washing or in efforts to normalize the Zionist settler colonial state. So as artists, our art is our resource and we can refuse to allow our labor to be used in service of art washing Zionism. It has never been and is no longer acceptable for cultural spaces to be silent on Palestine. As the organizers of this event, we uplift the Palestinian campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel. And if you don't know what that is, y'all have each received a pamphlet on your seat that you will take home and you will read and you will learn about what PACB is. We ask that you take up this responsibility in challenging and organize your institutions to participate in this call. Now is the time not to be afraid and there are resources at your disposal. We have just given you one. Uh, PACB also offers and this list is on their website that is also a resource for you. What Palestine teaches us is that art and culture should be in service of political goals because art always will be political. And this moment calls on artists and cultural workers to align our work and our actions in service of justice and liberation for Palestine. So with that being said, um, there are many different ways that you can plug into this work, specifically with us, the Palestinian Youth Movement and the People's Forum. We organize um, every Monday in this space at 6.30. Um, that's an invitation to each of you to come this coming Monday. We are organizing specifically artists and cultural workers in preparation for Land Day. And if you cannot make it uh, this coming Monday, maybe you can make it to the next one. And um, also we are organizing huge mobilization for Land Day on March 30th. And so if you can't come to the organizing meeting on Monday, then we'll definitely see you in the streets. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let's give another round of applause for Samia, Nelly, and Munir. Thank you to the People's Forum. Thank you for everybody that organized this event. There are refreshments in the back, balawa and some tea. So please help yourself. And please remember to visit the merch table at the front to support the fundraiser. Thank you. Thank you.